The message, I think, is obviously a very, a very big one. The core message really has to do with the outer world and the inner world. And especially as you say, though, you know, how do we always stay positive? Well, in a way, that's actually part of the problem because we've created this artificial concept of what's considered acceptable and what's not. We have an artificial sense of these emotions, these thoughts, these feelings are okay and these are not. Which means if you have disappointment or you have sadness or you have pain or you have frustration, in addition to having the pain or frustration or sadness, which is difficult enough, now we also have this inner critic. And of course, bolstered by an outer critic, should I dare to mention to anyone that I feel sad or frustrated that says, oh no, that's wrong. You shouldn't feel like that. Those are wrong feelings. And then in addition to what I was already feeling, there's a sense of shame. There's a sense of denial. There's a sense of mandatory repression. And so you can't force positivity. It's not sustainable. We have to be able to adapt to that which is real along with holding on to that which is ideal. And so to be able to say, I would like to be able to feel joy in this moment. And in this moment, I'm having an experience of sadness. Not to pretend that I'm not having an experience of sadness, not to belittle myself for it, not to shame myself for it, but also not to esko pakar karke betna hai as though there is nothing but sadness, but to simply be able to be present with it while simultaneously allowing the space for that which is going to bring me joy. And one of the, the key ways for this has to do with the inner world and the outer world. One of the, the reasons I think that today so many people are suffering from depression. In, in, in the Western world, it's literally something like one in four people are going to suffer from a major depressive episode during their life. I mean, that's huge. When you're looking at a culture that has pretty much attained everything, obtained everything, we're not dealing with hunger or homelessness or, oh my God, it's winter and I don't have a sweater or, oh my God, my child is sick and I can't get the medical care. To have a situation where between 15 and 25% of people are going to suffer a major depressive episode. The dilemma has become that that which we view as success is all of that which is outside. So it all has to do with the, the money, the acclaim, the fame, the titles, the, the external sense. And as anyone who has ever been super successful in the external world knows, and tragically we've just seen it with Shushant's suicide, is that does not translate on any way to inner fulfillment. But because we've got a culture these days that is inundating us with a sense of everything you want in life should be able to be achieved and acquired through money, through a good job, through a big house, through a lot of followers on social media, through people being jealous of you, through being, you know, the big man in the city, whatever it may be through looking the right way, having the right things, that then when we feel that very natural, very normal sense of yearning in life, of looking for something deeper, something more, there's nowhere to turn. And then we also, in addition to that normal feeling, now we've got shame. 
Because, oh my God, I shouldn't feel like this. This is bad. I should be positive. And it's really a tragedy because anywhere else in the body, any organ in the body, if it needed a little bit of help, if it was, you know, a little bit sluggish, we'd be able to get all kinds of help for it, whether Ayurvedic help or naturopathy help or, you know, hands-on healing energetic help or maybe even, you know, some medicine we needed to take, whatever it may be. All kinds of help we could reach out and get. You know, my pancreas is a bit sluggish or my liver is a bit sluggish. All kinds of stuff. No shame. No problem. Nobody's going to say, oh, just, you know, change your mind and your liver will obey. They're going to say, oh, drink this, take this, do this breathing exercise. Here's a wonderful yoga posture. Go for this retreat. Do this, do that. But when it's the mind or the brain, there's all this shame and there's all this sense that somehow we should have all of the tools already in our toolkit to know what to do with it. And so positivity is beautiful. It's essential, but only when it's real. We have to be sure that we are not using positivity as a, a superficial band-aid over a festering wound. Positivity works when we can actually create it from the inside, when we're able to connect with the source within ourselves. That's what our spiritual practice gives us. It's what meditation gives us, yoga gives us. It's what powers of using the mind gives us, mantra gives us, changing our beliefs, changing our thoughts. But it's not a band-aid. It's not a superficial way. And so this is where we have to really work from the inside. This is where for all of my young brothers and sisters, yes, do everything outside, have the career, have the success, have all of that. But make sure that you're also feeding your inner world. Make sure that you're also training your mind. You know, it's amazing because as I'm sitting here talking to you, if suddenly as I was speaking to you, my arms started going like this and I said, oh, don't worry about that. It's just my, you know, crazy arm. It does that sometimes. You'd think, that's really weird. That's a problem. Or if I started, you know, bouncing up and down kind of uncontrollably and I said, oh, don't worry about that. Those are just my legs. Well, up and up, I say, karlete kabi kabi you'd think that's a problem. We all understand intuitively that our arms and our legs should be something that we have the ability to work with, the ability to control. But our minds, the greatest tool we have, really that steering wheel that takes us to the destination of our life, I mean, you'd never get in a car, no matter how beautiful, if it didn't have a steering wheel or if the steering wheel didn't work. And that mind being the steering wheel of our lives. So many of us are content to just say, yeah, yeah, I have no ability to control it. Jaha jana chate, I say, chale chate. This is where, as we go to the gym for our muscles, as we take in the proper food for our physical bodies, as we learn all of the skills, whether it's music or dance or academics, whatever we're learning, science, medicine, law, accounting, whatever it may be, in the same way, we have to learn how to use our thoughts because they're vehicles and they take us to our destination. And so frequently we jump in these vehicles that we either have no idea where they're going or we know they're taking us to misery because we've jumped on them before. But we don't have the ability or the skills or the discipline to not jump on them. And that's where the spiritual practice is so important. 
working with the mind, working with our beliefs. These are the toolkits that will stay with you forever.